Uh, my background is as a natural historian, and that's how I came to Mokua Valley, to view it as a natural historian, and to view how the valley, the three valleys that make up Mokua, Kahanahaiki, Mokua, and Koyahi, uh, come together to make the greater Mokua that at one time had a very thriving Hawaiian population. It's also home to nearly 40 endangered species of plants and endangered birds and who knows how many species of endangered invertebrates. The image itself is a panorama was taken by overlapping about nine images and then stitching them together to make the entire valley. It's about four to five miles across. Most of Hawaii's valleys no longer have Hawaiian plants or uh, Hawaiians living in them. The rock itself is about 10 feet tall by 20 feet wide or thereabouts and it took nine overlapping images to give enough resolution so that you can see all the delicate petroglyphs that were carved into the rock. So there were certainly messages in the rock left to educate later generations. The etchings are of um, endangered species that live within uh, greater Makua Valley. This is a Manono that lives up the upper reaches above 2,000 feet and is found only on cliffs uh, and there are probably fewer than 50 individual plants remaining in the wild. The other image is our state flower, Ma'o Hauhele, uh, native yellow hibiscus and this form is found only in the Waianae Mountains and in Makua Valley. Our state flower is also an endangered species. Every time I've ever been to Makua Valley, there's been at least one person that says, I've only seen the valley through the chain link fence. You know, and, and that's always said, or, you know, a lot of people even that live in that area passing by, I've passed by this valley all the time, I only have seen it through the fence. This is my first time on the other side of the fence. And that's always really moving for me and, and, and um, really sad too, because Makua, that's our parent. Um, initially it was such a, you know, this bound woman and that's what I felt like the valley was, this, this bound, this bound um, ancestor and um, just the sacredness of not just Hawaiian-ness or Hawaiian land but also Hawaiian womanness, womanhood and so at first it was just being bound but for me it wasn't hopeful enough and so the idea that that we do now have access, even though it's extremely minimal. So planting within the valley, or planting in, in, our, in the earth, whether it's, it's there or elsewhere, it's an important part of um, just reconnecting. And so when you take an idea as strong as Makua Valley, as strong as war, I can say I hate war, I hate war, I hate war, as many times as I can say it. It doesn't, it doesn't take on its own body until I make something from that idea, from my feeling. And that's, I mean, I think that's what, what artists are, are really about. I think it's a lot easier to ignore protest because it's just, you stereotype it as just being angry people. And so a lot of times anger gets uh, misconstrued as unproductive and maybe not as focused. So when you do something like an art show, I mean, I think it's non-threatening. I think a lot of times art comes across as non-threatening, especially if it's pretty or beautiful. But um, if you come to an art show, and especially something like this, which gives you a chance to make a statement about something that you're passionate about or something that really matters. I do pictures or I, that tell a story. So they all tell a mo'olelo, a story, history of a spiritual process, a worldly event. Basically, I do language in three formats. I, I draw in petroglyphs. At one time, all people once read and spoke. So whether it's pictorial, if the meanings are defined, they're literally. Um, my two pieces on Makua is basically I'm speaking on behalf of the ancestors of the Ahupua of Makua. So it's their voice. And I act, I've been on accesses into the valley. I've been there on Easter sunrise. 
Um, this particular piece, I took a boat out because I wanted to see the view from when our ancestors came on a canoe. This is actually the ridge line of Makua Valley itself. Um, the Ahupua, there was much mana that flowed through. There was a large river that ran through the place. There were kapa beaters. Um, they traveled. There's a large kalo because they also grew kalo in that area. Um, this is man and woman standing in the light. These two petroglyphs, the bird man and the bird woman, represent mother and father God and family. So there was much um, history here. And so this, this particular piece, this is also the coconut fiber from the trees at Makua near the um, military office. So I had the opportunity to go and harvest from those trees. So it's the mana from Makua as well. So this is the text of the interpretation for the Mo'olelo picture. I hang low for children or for adults. Everything that I do is interactive. So the reader can actually read the interpretations of the petroglyphs, locate them in the picture, keep them in mind, and then read the literal meaning. I also crossed the meaning with Native American drums. This is actually a buffalo hide. The significance of the medicine of the buffalo is prayer and abundance. The language on this one forms two spirals, which is the ha, or the combined breath that breathes as one. Um, basically, this is now the voice of the ancestors of Makua. So when this drum is played, the ancestors are praying in abundance with us, whoever plays the drum. This is an interactive piece, so people will be able to come in the exhibit and play the voice of the ancestors. 